This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. My special guest today is John Doak. John, where are you coming from today, man? I am right now in Santa Cruz, California. Wow, the weather did look nice out that outside that little window there. Yeah, nice waves. It's a good thing. I'm I'm kind of vac- semi vacationing from my house at the moment. <laughs> so you're a surfer? Are you seeing nice waves? Are you out there? Uh, they're apparently nice waves because there's like at least a hundred surfers out this morning. Uh, my version of surfing was one time in Hawaii, and it was mostly me falling off a of board spectacularly. <laughs> Yeah, the moment I heard that some of these guys like um, surfboard over coral, I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that. That big pipeline in Hawaii, isn't that what happens? If you fall in it, you just get raked by the coral, Mm-mm. right? I don't know. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I can't even begin to start to like kind of vent on how crazy that is to me. Whoa. Make a mistake and you get ripped up. Now you're down in Miami, right? So there's uh there is there surfing down there? You know, I'm going to say no. Now about an hour north there's this town called Deerfield Beach and there's a pier and they try to do some surfing there. So you might get a 2 foot little chop if you're lucky. Maybe when a hurricane is coming in. When a hurricane is coming in, then then they'll they'll go out there with their boards, right? Um but Deerfield's about as close as you're going to get, like two feet, if you're lucky. If you're going out into a hurricane to surf, you were desperate for some waves. <laughs> <laughs> you try to go out. I, I, I've known some people who do that. So you, you try to go out like just like the day before when it's really, when it's still reasonable, right? Like if you're out there the day that it's just coming into land, like you, you deserve everything you get, right? I don't know. I think I'm in my car on my way up to Georgia or something at that point. Dude, but you know, sometimes I'm just going to say the story that, you know, the news reporters, they, they like this is their, their favorite time, right? Because they get to go outside. The cops don't tell them to go back in. They're out in the middle of this storm. They're doing their thing. I remember one time there is this weatherman and he's out in the middle of the storm and he's he's like looking like he's struggling just to stay on his feet. He's it's really bad out there. And this couple just walks by him like there's nothing going on. <laughs> And we're like, really, dude? Like, really? <laughs> you know, whatever you need to do to get those ratings, I guess. Whatever you need, man. All right, John, enough, 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 enough for that. Man. So give everybody the two-minute uh, drill on what John is doing today. Oh, what is John doing today? Well, uh, I just finished writing a book called Go for DevOps, uh, me and a, a guy named uh, David Justice um, finished writing. Uh, we released it about maybe about a month and a half ago or so. So we just kind of finished that up. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a principal engineer over at Microsoft. So I manage a group that, um, helps, uh, run, uh, data center, uh, management software. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, auditing of data sources and cleanup and this kind of thing to make it. So our data operations, uh, data center operations can run. So that's kind of what I do today, uh, on the side, you know, I do, training for various people who are looking to train and stuff like the go language to change their job, that kind of thing. I got to do one-on-one classes nowadays. I used to do really big classes for, you know, Google and Microsoft. Now I do a lot of one-on-one stuff, um, working on like little projects to, uh, I'm working on a, a new, uh, binary format to replace my use of protocol buffers, uh, with better tooling and such, you know, I don't know if anybody else will use it besides myself. <laughs> but uh, trying to get that just because uh, when you come from Google, protocol buffers are, are king. And when you uh, when you get outside, you have to use ProTalk yourself. And that's pretty painful. And there's a there's a great company called uh, Buff. Um, I think it's Buff.io, I think is their website, who are making uh, protocol buffer tooling. But you have to pay for it uh, if you want to, you know, use thing in multiple repos and that kind of stuff. It's great tooling if you if you can get your company to pay for it. So, um, but uh you know, I was kind of hacking around their stuff using their, their open source tooling in ways that were not intended. And I felt kind of dirty about that. So I decided to just write my own. 
Nice. Are you leveraging or using Go at, at your day job to do some of the uh, operational stuff you're doing? I have only programmed and Go is my primary, more than my primary language. I mean, I, I, there's been a couple of times I've like had to step out and touch some other code, but since Go was pre 1.0. So I haven't, and when I, I came over to Microsoft, you know, that was part of my deal was that I write. How long did it take you, you guys to write the book? Because I know the labor of love that is. So I'm always, congrats, first of all. I know how <laughs> difficult it is to get a book out. How long did it take you to write that book? About a year and a half. So there was, there was three of us to start with. One person had to bow out because they, they had their own issues to deal with. And then... Um, uh, so we you know, had to pick up the slack, you know, on that, which was kind of unexpected. And, uh, uh, it's a huge book. It's like 635 pages or something. Oh there's, my God. There's probably, I'm going to guess 50,000 lines of code in the, in the repo. Um, you know, 40 plus of just go code that's sitting in the repo for that thing. So it was a lot of work. <laughs> Do you incorporate modules and those types of things in that book? Or what's the main, who's the audience and what's the main focus of that? The main focus is someone, uh, so if you look at, um, if you look at the DevOps space, DevOps is pretty dominated by Python at this point. And, um, you know, that's kind of, if I go back 15 years or so, that's kind of the situation we were in at Google. Um, and my, I was uh, part of uh, the network oper operations groups. And we uh, we were really the first group to adopt Go at Google, and uh, we were in this horrible situation of Python failing us all over the place. It just couldn't scale, and uh, we had we adopted Go and we started moving forward with that. And that that was a huge boon for us. Uh, it took four years or more to like kind of move from one you know set of languages to another, um, but. Uh, this book is kind of meant as, as the same kind of, you know, everything in the industry kind of falls behind what the cloud, you know, big cloud providers are kind of doing, right? And uh, we, um, we want to kind of show that that could still, we could use that in Go is great for DevOps use, right? You know, if you look at all the tools, everything is built uh, using Go, right? You know, everything from your Terraform, your Packer, your Kubernetes, you know, everything is underlying is Go nowadays. Well, it's great if you can reuse all of that stuff within your DevOps uh, infrastructure instead of writing in Python and then having to um, deal with all the stuff that Python comes with. So we wanted to give a book that showed, hey, you're a DevOps person in Python. Here's an introduction to Go, say for the first chapters. And then how, here's how you use all these existing tool sets, you know, how you can integrate with Packer and, you know, build your own stuff how you can write, you know, operators, you know, in Kubernetes. Here's how you can do, uh, make your own Terraform providers. Here's how, if you want to leave that, uh, you can build your own workflow engines. Here's how you design against chaos, right? Because some of our biggest uh, cloud outages are actually uh, their, their SRE DevOps services knocking out their, their, uh, uh, their infrastructure. So here's how you don't do that for yourself. So the book kind of covers that complete gambit. Wow, dude, that that's a comprehensive sort of like one book has it all in it. Wow, dude, that's a lot. For us, what was interesting for me and David to write it together is David comes from a, a school where startups and these other things where you borrow as much as you can. And in borrowing that stuff, you modify it to do what you need. It may not do exactly what you need, but it does, you, you get it to 90%. You don't want to write it all yourself because that's not your primary job. And I come from the Google school, which is you don't use anything that anybody made. You write <laughs> all your own stuff from scratch. And so the book is kind of the merger of those, both those ideas, right? Like how do you use what's pre-existing to the best of your ability? How do you design stuff that, you know, is outside that to run your own thing? So like in the last chapter, for example, uh, I write a complete workflow engine um, that you can plug into. Um, so that way you can build your own external thing to your clusters and stuff and control them. Oh, dude, I'm getting, I'm getting this book, dude. I'm, I wasn't even thinking about it, but now I need to see what you've got in there because this sounds, I'm not on the ops side. I, I was in a former life. I don't want to be on the ops side. I'm impressed with anybody on the ops side. It's not what I want in my life anymore, but it sounds like you got some amazing code. 
my, my joke in training is always, I don't want to be woken up at three in the morning anymore. So I'm going to do this right because <laughs> I like to sleep, you know? Exactly. And, and I don't like getting woke up in the morning. You know, I'm a, you know, if you forget that, if you, if you, you can look at the book as a, like, not just a, for a DevOps workflow, which is really when you're on a separate team and, you know, it's from what I can tell. If you work in the mainline industry, DevOps is very similar to just the old ops model. You know, someone throws stuff over at you, so you get woke up at three in the morning, right? But, um, you know, and you want to get out of that situation. But this is also a great book for no ops people, people who are, you know, not in the DevOps field, but they're deploying their applications. So how do you, when your customer's calling you at three in the morning and there's, you are a team of five engineers in your startup, how do you not get woke up at three in the morning or at least have clarity. So we cover things like open telemetry in there. So, you know, how you can, uh, I'm not a big, huge fan of logs. So, um, you know, most developers are, but I prefer, I love the open telemetry method, the distributed tracing and using that for targeted logging. So you can get right to what your customer's problem is. So we cover that kind of stuff too. Man, I've been struggling. I incorporate and I show people how to incorporate open telemetry in my service class. And I've asked people on the open telemetry team like will you please explain to me how i'm t supposed to use this even beyond logs because i just don't have the experience and i saw one time in my service where i was like tracing everything the cpu just went like through the roof and that scared me to death what i'm t the parts of it i'm teaching in the book and the open telemetry kind of gets covered between both me and David uh, between chapters. But um, I believe in kind of a dial up method. So when I use open telemetry, I do sample, you know, I sample at different points. So, um, and then uh, we also have it so that, you know, a customer by an ID, we can just turn up and say, okay, now we want their particular traces. We can also whitelist them and allow them to tag what they want us to trace. And then we, they get a number and we now know uh, exactly what to look through for their problem. So, which is, you know, kind of key for customers. Yeah, that's the chapter I'm gonna read first, just that. I wanna, I wanna show people how they can leverage the tech more in that service class that I have. And I just have not had the, the right people or the resources to kind of do it. So now I'm super excited just to, just to read those chapters. And not to, not, you know, I know a lot, of reason, a lot of the reason people don't use open telemetry, it's because it's hard. I mean, you got to set up that infrastructure. You're going to, you know, you have to have, a th you have to have collectors, you have to have all this other stuff. So we kind of try to, in this, we're using, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the chapters where I, where we don't have to set up infrastructure, I try to keep it just pure go. So for example, there's some, uh, there's some workflow stuff in which I just create, I just created a go level seven load balancer for you to use, right? That way you just turn it up and not have to do all the Docker, but we have Docker stuff too. So you can just flip up the infrastructure and, um, and get ready for your open telemetry. We're going to get back to all that stuff, but this is a podcast about you, John, you, and I, I want to know more about you. So help everybody out first. Uh, what year did you graduate? I'm going to age you now. Sorry. What, and you're still younger than me, so it doesn't matter. What what year did you graduate high school, John? I graduated in 94. 1994. Okay, that's when I moved to Miami after uh, after graduating university in 91. So that's that's a good year, 94. That's okay. Uh, and I imagine you graduated in high school in California? No, Tennessee. The, that's where the accent's coming from. Ah, Tennessee. Uh, where where I, The only area of Tennessee I know is Nashville, because I have a home in Huntsville, so I've been to Nashville, which is a crazy city. I really don't. I don't know. Nashville is uh, it's too wild for me, dude. I'm slowing down, but we're, we're kind of in Tennessee. Nashville. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> Do you like that? I guess. Okay, I got to ask you the question. Do you like Nashville? Like if you're if you go back there and right, what are your thoughts on Nashville? You know, Nashville doesn't look a lot like what it did when I was growing up. I mean, um, so I drove cross country uh, this last year and uh, went from California to Nashville, Nashville back. I drove and uh, spent, I spent like a month and a half in Nashville. Um, and I toured some people around who were visiting me from some other countries and I was, uh, you know, touring them around the state. Um, you know, it's weird. It's just, it's, it's such a different place from when I grew up. 
Um, if you're really into, you know, country music bars, all that stuff like that, Nashville's got it going on. Apparently they call it Nash Vegas now, you know, it's a huge bridal party. Uh, you know, you're going to get married. You just, you show up there and you know, your last nights of debauchery, um, that's, it's fairly huge there. But you know, Kid Rock bought a, a building, dude, it's five or six stories of just a bar and you can't even walk in there. And it's like mind blowing to me that you've got that many people just partying at that level. I went by that a couple times when I was, you know, because I ended up was at the Johnny Cash thing, and then we were, you know, listening to some music, and the, you know, there's a thing right down the street from the from the Kid Rock, and you know, so I was down there a couple times. Eagles were playing at the auditorium when I was down there. There's just you know so much music scene going on there, and the music's good. Yeah, yeah, the music, music's good. There's also cows with people being plowed. <laughs> literally get plowed carrying people so yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know dude i i think i just i i love the the scene in miami but for some reason the scene in nashville is a whole nother level i just it's not my thing but if you're young and and you're looking looking for that then nashville you gotta you gotta check out nashville yeah so you graduate in 94 uh in high school but i want to talk a little bit about kind of high school what is your first memory of working on a computer, like like, what's your earliest memory? I think it was helping my sister with punch cards, maybe. She was doing some class, I wanna say it was high school and she was doing punch cards and I was helping like, I don't know, write something for, they, you know, I guess the car, I remember the cards coming in a box and you know, you had to keep the order of it for it to execute in your program. I never saw the machine that it went into and it was like writing numbers on it to keep, you know, so that that uh, I guess if they fell, you knew what the order was. That's my kind of earliest memory. My 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 really doing stuff was probably on TSR 80s and Commodore 64s. Do you remember how old you were with the the punch card stuff? Like like I had to be ac like 100% accurate, but she was doing high school level work with punch cards. Yeah. So my so I've got I've got uh, I got three older siblings who you know are more than you know could be you know some of them more than ten years older than me. So yeah, she was. They were doing some punch cards. Probably she's probably doing it at McGavick High School. I would guess. I could be wrong. Maybe she had gotten to college, but I'm pretty sure it was high school. And you remember doing some programming on a TRS eighty? I did. I did do a lot of little basic programs on TRS TRS eighties. Do you remember how old you were, what grade you were in at the time you were, because you, you didn't have that machine. That machine must have been at school, right? Or, or you had the machine. No, it was at my house. Oh, it does. Okay. Who brought in, who brought a TRS-80 home? My father, so my, my father was an attorney. And so he was kind of fascinated with computers to some extent. And uh, during that period, he got more, uh, more into computers a little later. But uh, he probably, my guess is he probably got it from a client. Like he, he would have different, he was a lawyer. And so cl various clients wouldn't always want to pay with money. And so they'd be like, oh, here, I have this TRS-80. You can have that, you know, kind of thing. Oh my God, dude. I, I just heard a story <laughs> talking about this, where uh, this guy wasn't, he didn't have the money to pay his lawyer. So he was offering him like a $2 million horse. Wow. And the guy's like, the guy's like, dude, like this isn't like, 300 years ago where we did trade like i want to get paid <laughs> imagine that i don't have the cash for you here but i got this horse i promise you it's worth two million go take the horse <laughs> my father my father liked the wheeling and dealing of that kind of stuff you know i'm not you know because uh, you could you could you could make trades with a lot less tax implications i guess than uh for things you needed or wanted <laughs> But that's wild. So uh, do you remember, like, maybe you're in, like, middle school, junior high school, or is this high school where, where you kind of read? No, this was I had maybe in elementary school by the time when I started on the TRS-80. You know, maybe I was seven or eight, maybe, maybe. Uh, because I went from the TRS-80 to the Commodore 64, but by 1985, I was working on Max, and that would have been about nine then, so... But at home too, you got a Mac at home, or again, that was in school. 1985, my father came home with a a Mac 128. Dude, he's got to find some paying clients. You understand that, right? <laughs> my mother would have said the same thing, really. <laughs> that's brilliant. So, so now you got this Mac, but that's a whole different sort of machine than than 
you'd been playing with. I always felt those machines were pretty pretty well locked down. Well, so it was it, it was funny because what had happened was um, my father uh, had this IBM PS2 in his office that he could never figure out how to run, and I'd gotten WordStar to work on it, and my father was quite upset that his little kid, you know, <laughs> had, had gotten this work. And so someone, someone had showed him this, this Mac and my father was like, well, I want that, right. You know, I can, you know, I can, I can use this mouse thing. And then that's when my father really got into computers and he was really, he was really into computers through, um, you know, until about Mac OS X came along. And that was just a, so much of a change that he didn't quite make that transition. But, uh, yeah. So I was working, I, I, so I started becoming a Mac expert, you know, somewhere after 85. Wow. And were you doing any, any sort of programming on that? Or you were just really learning the guts of the OS and, and the machine? I was really just running the machine and stuff like that. I would do a lot, you know, I ended up doing a lot of diagnostics for a lot of people, you know, which on the old Macs was, you know, using suitcase to reorder CDEVs and control panels and which order they would go in because there's no real kernel in the old, old Macs. And, uh, the uh i didn't get it i did get into programming but that was probably in the early 90s when i uh my first uh, i mean i would do hypercard programming things like that um where it had its own kind of little pseudo language within like things like hypercard and i would do stuff like that but uh um i didn't get into real programming i got into c programming with something called think c and then in probably about 1990 or so um, in between that, I really had gotten into running bulletin board systems. So I was running a BBS out of my house for a long period of time. What machine were you using to run the BBS on? Not the Mac. Oh, yeah, it was a Mac. Oh, uh, it was. Okay. Yeah, I started with, uh, because once my father had gone Macs, we would never dare have a PC in our house. And, uh, and frankly, I kind of had bought into that, too. Because, you know, if you looked over at a DOS thing and you're like, extended, expanded, what? Like, I, no, you know. And, uh, you know, where's your mouse? You don't have a mouse yet, you know? So, um, you know, uh, I was using something originally, it was called Red Rider Host to host bulletin board services. And then later they had something, it, uh, the guy changed it over to something called Second Sight. Um, and then uh, I was using that. And I actually, I haven't turned it up. Uh, I just brought all my, back, my Macintoshes from Nashville and I brought back my original 20 megabyte hard drive the first hard drive i ever had it's you know it's this big <laughs> and uh, it's it should have my bulletin board service on it if it's still uh you know if the drive heads haven't crashed after all this time as you're entering high school you already have this kind of huge tech background already like you've done are, are there other things you're interested in though it can't just be all computers so as you're as you're getting into high school what else are you doing well, I was I was busy being a big outcast. I think <laughs> going into high school, uh, so that occupies enough of your of your time when you're young. Um, you know, you're doing the. You know, I was probably at that point interested in. I don't know. I was doing martial arts a lot, that kind of things. I was into movies a lot, and that's where I thought I was going to go in. Um, even through past college, I thought I was going to go into the movie industry, which I guess I kind of did. Computers were something that was fun, and it wasn't, a, but it wasn't what I was looking for in a job. I was expecting to go into uh, cinematography and that kind of thing as I kind of went forward. So then I, I imagine then in high school, you're doing that sort of stuff too. You got a camera, you're making movies. You're like, what are you doing that, that that's your interest? I mean, I would do little movie stuff, but not much. Because, um, you know, if you go back to that point, uh, you know, movie stuff is expensive, right? Like even camcorders back then are fairly expensive. Editing software was hugely expensive. Um, you know, an, an avid media composer was like, you know, a half million dollars, uh, you know, back this is, this is nineties, right? You know, when I got into college, I started getting access to stuff. I started doing some you know, radio work and then I started doing, um, I started interning for a company doing, uh, you know, where I was helping to re-edit you know, some uh, music videos and uh, com car commercials, things like that. Uh, and I got my. Yeah, but don't 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 jump that far. I want to stay in high school. Oh, first. Don't, don't. I want to I want to stay in high school for a second because I'm trying to trying to get a sense of what you you were kind of interested in. I know that you're 
you're you're getting really good at at, at the operating system and the systems and, and fixing that, and you're doing some of that work for people. Your uh, but your interests seem to lie somewhere else, and maybe maybe you just didn't think that that was something that you can do as a living, or it just really wasn't interesting to you as a living. It just it just wasn't interested. I wasn't interested into it as a living um, at that point. It was just something I did that was kind of fun. And I helped a lot of, you know, people would come to me all the time and I would go fix their computers and all this other stuff. Um, and I, you know, I hadn't got into PCs or anything yet. Back then, you know, I was playing a lot of video games and uh, there weren't a lot on the Mac. So uh, you got to play a lot of them over and over again. I had, a, I had a friend of mine who had a PC, so I'd go over there and play Wing Commander and these other kind of things. Um, but the only thing that, that a PC was better at at the time was playing games. There was nothing else that I wanted. If I wasn't playing a game, I was, you know, so I would, you know, I would, you know, uh, on my Mac, I'd be doing things like um, I'd use something called Macromedia Director and I would make little animations and things like that. I would make interactive ones with uh, HyperCard because you could trick HyperCard into animating stuff by making it move through cards fast and um, things like that. And uh, of course, I'm the worst worst artist like i have no skill at it so you know welcome to the club <laughs> so yeah that's a, so i was doing a lot of that kind of stuff i was doing a lot of sound design too there was something called sound edit pro and uh i got my hands on the little thing with them you know because back then they didn't have even dedicated mic ports on these old macs so you had to like hook in through some type of serial port with a little you know sound edit box that you would buy from I think the company was called, I think it was Macromedia owned it. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, we'd be, I'd be doing, you know, I'd be doing all this weird stuff with sound, like I was going to become a sound editor or something. It was just fun stuff to play with back then. So no sports, no music, no, no uh, karate. You were doing karate. Yeah, I was doing, I was doing a lot of Ishinru, um, in, you know, somewhere into high school. So before high school, into high school. And then I stopped that when I was probably about 16 or so. Um, no, I, 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 yeah, I played sports all when I was young and I'm terrible at, you know, I don't mind playing sports, but I'm, you know, I'm not gifted at any particular sport. Uh, martial arts was kind of my favorite downhill skiing. I like doing, uh, but you live in Nashville. So it's not like you're going to be doing that on your high school team. Plus the reason I was good at that was just because I could go straight down in a, down a hill. <laughs> You know, if I had to be doing all the curves, then, you know, you know, all things are off. But, you know, gravity was my friend. So as you're in your senior year in high school, you got to start thinking about what happens after high school. So where what what was what were those conversations in your head like? like what, what were you thinking about post high school? Well, I was I was thinking, really, how do I not fail out of high school? <laughs> That's okay. What was, that's what I, that was what I was first thinking. <laughs> After that, uh, it was, it, there wasn't really much doubt that I was going to go to college. That was, that was kind of the expectation I was going to go into college. The next thing was, okay, now that I've managed to not fail out of high school, how do I manage to get into college? So, um, what, wait, wait, before that, before that, what I, I struggled to graduate high school as well. Like my history teacher found as many points as he could in my final essay to get me like a 66 on that final report or I wasn't going to graduate. Uh, I just wasn't mature enough in high school. Like I didn't take it seriously. But did you have, have a similar story? Was there like one or, one or two subjects that were just really tough, not interesting? Or, or was it an immaturity level like me? It was, it was different it was different things. So the, you know, I, as I found in life, I have, uh, people either tend to love me or they really just do not like me at all. And that included my teachers. So I had teachers who really loved me and I had teachers who really didn't. So I had, uh, one or two who were particularly trying to fail me out and a few who were trying to keep me alive. Uh, I, you know, I struggled with mathematics, I would say. Um, it, what I would say is my brain was probably about two years behind where it needed to be. I think we all, you know, the school system kind of expects you at an age to be here and the stuff. But, you know, biologically, I think we 
our brains mature at different levels. And I think mine was probably about two years behind what it needed to be to absorb some of the mathematical stuff. Um, so I did, I did fairly well in English and those other things, uh, when I wasn't upsetting teachers and, uh, uh, foreign language, which is a skill that never came into, I, I, I've never, I bribed my way, um, in high school, I bribed my way out of, uh, French, for example, that's how I, I passed is I, I bribed the teacher. Um, so, um, you do what you gotta do, John, <laughs> I bribed for some good grades by, uh, switch giving uh, computing equipment to to the the the, the French stuff. So uh, I think statute limitations are over at this point. Yeah, so, I think you're fine. Uh, the other is, you know, um, I had I had another teacher who was trying to fail me for not showing up on time. I would uh, it was my first class. I would never I would never show up to that class because the uh, I I didn't learn anything from the teacher. And I was having to be tutored by a friend of mine at Vanderbilt uh, University in the evenings. And uh, he did not take my assertion to him that, uh, you know, he, that uh, the reason I didn't have to come in was because he couldn't teach anything. And that I was getting, <laughs> I was getting all, my, all my, my teaching from my tutor. And uh, I was passing all the tests, but I wasn't showing up on time. So, you know, they can also fail you for not showing up on time. But you graduated. So... Barely. Somehow, somehow <laughs> somebody finally said, no, no, we don't want John here for another year. Get him out of here. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> it doesn't sound like your GPA was, was your GPA good? Like, cause you're passing the tests or I don't need a number. I'm just saying like in, in, in relation to the university that you want to kind of go to, right? Because my GPA really wasn't where it, probably should have been for some of the schools I kind of wanted to go to. It was below three and there was no, uh, I mean, I, you know, we, we had some money and back then colleges were a little cheaper than they are today. Right. We've, you know, it just exponentially continuing to go up, but, uh, the, you know, it was, I could go to a state school if I had had almost perfect grades, unless I had, um, I could have got some really, good scholarships, which would have been really doubtful. Um, there was, I was still going to go to a skate school. So the difference between a 4.0 for me and, you know, 2.5 is, you know, uh, probably at the bottom, which is probably getting towards the bottom of where the universities want you in there, um, was, didn't matter. It didn't matter. So you ended up going to what school? University of Tennessee. So you're a volunteer, man. That's, that's pretty wild. And when you when you started school, did you have an idea of what you wanted to major in, or you just said, you know what, this is my transition. I have to do this, so I'll figure it out. It was more of that was that was kind of it. And so, you know, there weren't really film studies or anything there. I, I think I started out with trying to triple major um, in electrical engineering, computer science, and uh, broadcasting. Did you go into university with this? new attitude of I'm going to take these academics seriously and show up to class on time. Oh, no. Oh, but I'm going to try to major in three well, I may, I may have thought of that for the first time <laughs> right before I got there in reality. So, <laughs> you know, but I, you know, I was interested, you know, I figured do what you're kind of interested in. And uh, I couldn't do film because I didn't have film, though I did take some classes and writing and stuff like that while I was there. Um, so I started taking, you know, uh, intro, you know, all the engineering, intro to engineering classes that you needed to do to, to move up in engineering. I started taking computer science classes and then, uh, I hadn't really had exposure to computer science yet, you know, algorithm development, that kind of stuff. So, Did you do that in your freshman year of university? You were taking some computer science classes? Mm -hmm. Or that came later? Okay. How did you like those classes? I mean, with the background that you were developing at home. I, you know, mostly if I was to look at back at CS, I would say that most CS degrees are useless, you know, completely useless for 99% of the people out there. No, I mean, very few people are practicing computer science. Uh, people are using computer science. So I, you know, I think, I think, a cl you know, classes on, you know, which algorithm do you need to use it, you know, to accomplish certain jobs. i uh, fine if you're writing those algorithms, um, probably you're wasting your company's money. You know, someone's already developed something that's, you know, does the job by that point, right? Like, you know, do you need to make a B-tree implementation 
for C++ or do you just use someone else's, right, that's existed? But you did know how NeoHyatt works and why you want to do it. And that can be covered really easily. So the first, the, the, the first classes in computer science, I really uh, like them. Uh, you know, they're basically introduction to programming. And uh, back then they were doing C, so uh, you really got to learn how that stuff works, you know, underneath. I had some C experience from before, but, you know, it was basic algorithms. Um, as you kind of go up, it gets less interesting. Normally, I would argue that the classes become more interesting because you get to start working on some more real practical stuff, as I did in my computer science degree. I, you know, I didn't find, I didn't find that. I mean, you know, all the stuff that I learned, you know, when you start doing it in, uh, as a real job, like, you know, the importance of tests and why you use certain things and, you know, that, you know, and you work on real problems that was kind of missing in my degree program. I mean, we made, you know, I, I remember making things where, you know, Godzilla had to move around and, you know, crush things and, you know, on my sun station and things like that. But, uh, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't really a lot of practical stuff. It was like, here's algorithms and you use them for, you would use them when you are trying to do this and know how to write them. And that, wasn't particularly interesting to me. So, but did you end up graduating? Let's just put, I'm a bad student. So I'm going to throw that out there. But at the same time, I was, I was, I was also suffering from, I had these horrible migraines and I would had about two and a half weeks of every month. I was knocked out. I had started in high school, the, the last maybe year or two in high school. And I just kept through university and I, you know, I was going to all these doctors. They they back then, they were just starting to have some medications for people who had migraines, suffered migraines. I would, uh, I would literally almost go blind, like, you know, for a bunch of that time because you would, the pain would be so bad from light coming in. You, you had to stay in a completely dark room and you couldn't have any noise and that kind of stuff. It was just awful. It's Is awful. this still happening today or? It slowly started uh, going away uh, in my twenties and by my mid thirties, I wasn't, I was, I was only having a few a year and then now i don't have them at all almost whatever was going on in your body at that time yeah was just wild and it was a, it was a real problem because i was taking you know i was i was doing injections i was taking you know there were medications that would they would totally fix it but then i was just drooling because i couldn't move uh and uh you know things like that so you know, there was there were time periods in that I thought I would never be able to hold a job or do anything because you know how do you hold a job when you know you're you know you know two and a half weeks of a month or something you're just out, and that makes you know passing college kind of difficult. You know, I I'm a procrastinator anyway, and again I'm not a great student. Sometimes I'm just smart enough I can I can kind of get by. Uh, but if you if you got that kind of thing going on, combine laziness and you know bad student with you know debilitating you know, illness, and you're not graduating. So you dropped out after that one year or, or your second year? Or... Well, I went in. I went in. I went in four years. And after four years, you know, my uh, uh, my parents were basically like, you know, um, yeah, let's you know, you got four years, and so you know, let's not you know, you know that's what you get. And I'm like that's reasonable because you weren't required to give me four years of anything. Right. You know, you know, when you reach 18, you know, your parents' responsibility are over. And if they're nice enough to want to help you do stuff, that's great. But, um, they were not required. My parents are great, but they weren't required to do that. And I, you know, to be fair, I think they were trying to, or my mother specifically was trying to, you know, uh, you know, make me take something, you know, try to do more on, you know, to graduate. My version was that was like, yeah, I don't want to waste your money. And so let's just, let's stop that. So I stopped college at that point. So you stopped college. I'm imagining you moved back into your parents' house there. For a, yeah, for a little bit, um, for another year or two. Um, and I was, uh, I was working, I, you know, I was working on jobs uh, and stuff. So I would do, you know, I was, I was, I think I was still doing some ballet work because I was always, I was always working at something, you know, all during the time that someone, so I would try to, I would do valet work at a hotel in Nashville. And then, you know, when I was working, when I was at the university, I would work nights um, at a sorority dorm at the front desk. Um, Cause if I got a migraine, I just got a migraine. That was just what it was, you know, but it's at night. Is that like a security? Kind of like, so the University of Tennessee, they don't have um, sorority dorms. Uh, they don't have sorority houses. They have a sorority dorm. 
Um, and so I would work the front desk there as security, I guess, uh, a little, um, mostly, you know, uh, cause you know, guys weren't allowed in, I think. In the Except world. you, you were allowed in. Except for I was allowed in. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying it was a bad job. I'm just saying. I'm, just Actually, saying. I'm, I'm more interested in the, the, the best car you ever got to valet actually i never did that job but i always imagined like in the movies somebody shows up in a ferrari or something they take it out so i wasn't you know honestly i wasn't i wasn't really into cars all that much at the time i it, it, maybe if we'd had some classics come in we rarely had that um the most expensive car of the time i ever saw was someone came in in a maserati and uh you know, uh, the Maserati is funny because the Maserati's battery died for whatever reason. And it had to, we had to jump it off in the garage and I was jumping the Maserati off, but I had this, uh, old El Camino and, uh, the way the wires were done, cause we had rewired it ourselves. The positive was black and the negative was red. My boss watching me like hook in to the car and he's like, no, I'm like, <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> you know, thought he was going to die right there on the spot. That is uh, uh, okay. All right. So you have these odd jobs. Um, you're doing that for a year and a half. You're dealing with these headaches that are still not going away. At this point, it's 98, 99. You're almost like in the year 2000 here. Yeah. So, so what happens now in the year 2000? Like a year and a half now with your with your parents. Well, so we're somewhere in the uh, somewhere into two thousand because between then I started I started to go and there was a little film school that opened up in Nashville, so I started taking some classes there. Wait, I'm I'm going to hold you for a second. Yeah. I'm, I'm, what is it about the film that you're so engrossed in? Like what? Because you keep bringing this up over and over again, but I don't see you doing anything necessarily related to it. Right. And so it's really hard to, so, you know, back, you know, you're here. So, you know, I had, by this point I had interned, like I said, I, you know, I'd gotten into an internship. Uh, I, I go off to this little film school cause I still want to do film at some point. You know, I thought maybe I would try to go get at some point it, it was fantasy, but uh, I would go to someplace like UL, UCLA or USC and try to finish off a degree there with uh, stuff. Then I realized what out of state tuition cost and uh, that kind of stopped that. But I, I went as far as going actually and visiting the campuses in California, which is when I decided I wanted to move to California. Um, and, uh, and during that trip, I ended up going up to San Francisco. So I was, San Francisco, and I was like, Oh, I, you know, if I have to sit there and wait for two years of residency so I can get cheaper tuition, I'd like to live in San Francisco. I did not look at housing prices, um, which would have been a, a key factor that might have stopped me. And, so you went uh, to film school in San Francisco? No, I went to film school in Nashville. So I'm still, still in Nashville. Take a, I take, I'm starting taking some film classes. I take myself an internship. I think the place was called Evergreen Communications. Um, and I started uh, like basically interning for this editor there. And so I'd be, you know, tagging stuff in this music video stuff or, you know, learning some stuff about media composer and um, from commercials they were doing. We'd be cutting those on DigiBeta, I think it was. And uh, so I got some experience a little on that stuff there. And But, you know, film stuff was just expensive. I mean, you know, everything in film, nowadays, film's cheap. You want to learn how to do it for a few thousand dollars, you're golden. Here, you know, you're still talking you know, I don't know, minimum of 50,000 and you're still renting equipment, you know, to do any real editing and that kind of stuff back then. Um, so I'm trying to get exposure to that and try to, I'm trying to figure out how I can get into the film industry because I have no idea. I'm in Nashville and you know, that's so far away from the film industry. There just isn't a film industry. Um, so music videos, that kind of stuff was the closest I could get with this little tiny film school there. Uh, you know, 2000 is approaching, uh, I get a girlfriend uh, who, uh, you know, was the registrar, one of the registrars of my film school. And, uh, and we decide in 2000 to move to California. You know, I'm going to get residency there and then try to get into USC or UCLA. And this is before finishing this film school. It's just, just in the middle of all that. Yeah, and at the same time, I was trying to run my own business too. Um, I'd gotten into, you know, selling computer systems I was hand building. Um, which started out great, started out great, um, and then went to 
poo as um, two things, factors really happened at the time. There was this huge earthquake around Taiwan and for about, I don't know, a year and a half or so, memory prices, of sticks of memory cost more than machines to buy. And, uh, you, you know, Dell and them had long term contracts with memory providers on what they were going to pay. And John Doak did not <laughs> have contracts with them. So, uh, that was, that was happening. And the second thing that was, cause I, you know, I was, my differentiator was not just having a personal contact to be able to help you with your systems and things like that. Everything was custom built for whatever you wanted. But the second thing was that, uh, back then, uh, AOL and stuff started literally giving machines. There's things called e-machines or whatever. They were literally giving them away if you would just sign up for AOL or CompuServe or whatever at the time. You I'm trying to before? remember that. I, I mean, I remember this. I was using CompuServe. I never liked AOL, but yeah. I'm trying to remember the machines. Yeah, they were, they were these little machines. Uh, these and they, you know, if you paid for them, it was like 150 bucks. And people are like, well, why should I pay, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars for a machine when I can get this thing? So that would be the business people would be saying that. I'd be like, well, because if you get that machine, you'll you'll know, right? And and uh, you know, because you can't do anything with it. Um, I still had some gamer stuff, but then once the memory thing hit, that was really a problem. And I was like, you know what? I just need to shut this down and go off and do this other stuff. So then I'm packing up a car and. Moving to California. Wow. With your girlfriend? With my girlfriend. And you, you knew where you were staying? Are you, are you already? Nope. So you're just like, we're going to use a hostel for as long as it takes? No, we, we literally, we just you know, figured, and it, it kind of worked out like this. We would drive over there, and we would get a, you know, we'd find a place to live, and then we'd go find jobs. And that's kind of what we did. So what was the reality after you got to San Francisco? <laughs> well, the reality was all that did happen, you know, it's me and this forerunner driving, you know, dragging a U-Haul behind it uh, over the Rockies and, and stuff. And I get to San Francisco and we find a place, a place at 8th and Market uh, over this Chinese restaurant thing. So we had the biggest rats you've ever seen in this, this complex. And we bought a studio, I think, I mean, this is 2000 and people are going to laugh. They're like, oh, it was so cheap. It was not cheap back then. I think it was like 1200 1400 a month, something like that, um, to have a place there. That was expensive, you know. You I know. know. Did you have that money? How much How much cash did you have? Probably had about, we probably, between us, probably about 15000 We probably had, you know, total to figure figure it out. Cash. All right. So that, that gave you like six months, give or take, to figure yeah. it out. And she... She, you know, we got jobs pretty much immediately. She got a job as a registrar at another, at uh, another college. And I got it in, um, this is dot com. So dot coms are still hot. They haven't, they haven't burned out yet. So I got, I, I first started working in a mail room just to get a job. Right. And then, um, uh, so I was doing, I was in a mail room at like, you know, a place that was doing, uh, you know, stockbroker. So I started seeing the first of the dot com stuff start to happen. And uh, then I went to work for a company called Convene.com. Wait, wait, wait! You were in the mail. You were working in the mail room for one of these. One of these brokers for for you know maybe two or three weeks because you know you, you know need a job. I'm, I'm not so proud. If I need a job, you need money. You know, you do what you got to do. And uh, you know, mail room is fine. You know, fine. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Very cool. So uh, you know, and then I went to work for this Convene.com as a contractor. That was, you know, I, you know, at that point, I wasn't a system architect or anything, but I could look at what they were doing and my eyes were just like, you know, they were, they had, they were using Microsoft Exchange to serve like everything, like these online classes. So they had this huge exchange system, a running exchange five, five, I think it was. Uh, I mean, even trying to serve video out of it. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Was crazy. What were you hired for in that job? Tech support, basically. I started out in tech support there. I was still just, I was still just temping really at that point. You have these technical chops, like, you know, it, I know it, you know, and I guess this was you, you getting back into finding a way back into tech at that point. Yeah. Cause I didn't really have contacts and stuff there. And you know, dot coms were kind of huge and I was, I was trying to, you know, I, you know, I'm new to the city. I'm trying to figure out stuff. Uh, I need a job, I need money. So I'm, you know, I'm taking temp work. And at that point people were so desperate for so desperate for workers 
that you know you just had to say that you knew something like java because java was the hot word back then and you got i was going to ask you, you what the job. interview was like i knew like for that job for you but you're saying oh, well, that they did, wasn't well, a problem for tech was for tech support stuff because i was doing tech support for their platform you know the they just uh i went to a temp agency i'd worked for in nashville and they just they sent me out there the and these guys liked me you know because i could do the job and then they offered me a permanent position about two months after I'd been there. But by that point, I'd, I'd already picked up a permanent position over at uh, LucasArts, the game company in Marin. What were you doing over there? What did you get hired for over there? Um, at, they brought me in to be like basically a senior desktop support uh, person there. Uh, they needed to... Um, they needed to get some control over how they deployed systems and stuff like that. So I went to go work over there. And but now you're in a film. I mean, LucasArts is a film company, isn't it? Uh, it was the game company uh, part, arm, but it wasn't very long after that that I was in the film part of that, too. Uh, we were all separate IT departments. LucasArts had their own, Sky Sound, uh, Lucasfilm, ILM. And then uh, slowly, as we started looking in the long term towards moving into the Presidio, everything starts to join together. So um, on that journey, I eventually was in, you know, film stuff as well. How long were you there, Lucas? Five years, basically. Okay, so you started that job maybe like 2000, 2001? Somewhere in 2000 is when I started that. And you're there for five years, dude. So yeah. I'm super interesting, interested in kind of understanding briefly where you end up in those five years, right? Because you must be really learning and getting really strong skills now on the on the tech side, on the op side. Like, where do you end up in five years? Then? So it's kind of a journey. So I was, you know, I was desktop support at, just at first, and then I was, in at, and at first I'm the only, I'm the only tech that knows the Mac and knows Windows and such. And then um, I know some Unix, so uh, I get trained to be an IRIX admin for them because we still had a bunch of IRIX machines. Then I get a little bit of sun training. So I'm starting to do that. I'm starting to run some of their server stuff. Um, then I move into uh, network engineering there. Um, and then I take over the Big Rock campus and the uh, Skywalker uh, campus. And then through another merger, uh, I'm with the people from ILM. Uh, this is when I meet Raleigh Mann, who I go on to work for at Google, where uh, we become a consolidated networking thing. And we go off to build the Presidio. So I'm really at the end of this. I, I'm like a senior, you know, network engineer there. I mean, this was a fantastic kind of job to have, to have landed. It was. It was. So it was. It was great, except for two things: they don't want to pay you. And, uh, they, yeah, they'll work into the ground. So there was like, you know, there was maybe a two year period there when I was 24 by seven on call, like, you know, um, <laughs> um, and part of that was because I lived close to the camp, the, some of the campuses. And, uh, so when there would be outages, you know, the camp, the thing would go, you know, we had data centers go completely down and they would send me in to go turn everything up. Um, so, cause no one else wanted to drive in. So, all right, yeah. two questions, two questions before we move, figure out what happens after that. One, in those five years, are you still with your girlfriend? And two, what is your parents' attitude now towards you and thinking after five years of this, I think, a really good, stable sort of job? Oh, I, you know, I don't think they were ever, you know, my parents, I don't think my parents were ever really too worried about me. You know, my father, I would say, probably did not want me to be in this industry at all. Like what he really wanted me to do is become a lawyer and then work for him. Like I think that was thinking the dream that he had for all of his children is that he would have this, you know, in, you know, this big law firm with all his children in it. Um, and none of that worked out. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think they were really worried about me. And, you know, they, they you know, I would take them into, um, uh, because you, when I was in IT and I was doing certain things there, I had access to pretty much everything in all the campuses. So I got to take, I took them on the big rock in the middle of the night and showed them stuff, you know, that you couldn't you know, see otherwise. And, you know, I toured them around the, you know, stuff. If their friends came in, I would, I would tour them around Skywalker. So they were, you know, they were happy go lucky. Um, I just imagine that they must have had some negative thoughts when you just packed up your car and went to California. I can't say you weren't totally worried. I think they were more, to be honest, I think they were more worried about me 
going out there with the girlfriend than I think they were uh, me going out there. But, and to answer your earlier question, yes, uh, we're still together by the end of, of this, uh, this five years. I'm guessing it then at the five year mark here, you're starting to realize how good you are, how underpaid you are. And people are now probably approaching you with other opportunities because you've met so many people in the five years. Some of that, I, you know, I was, I, I would say I was looking for opportunity. Um, I was, I was thinking about going, trying to go over to Google. We had been so mistreated, the people in networking and stuff by the time we, by the end of, you know, building out the Presidio, we were all exhausted. Uh, we all just started leaving, every one of us. Um, there were, I think there were only two people who remained when I was, when I left. Uh, one who's still there, I believe, and the other, uh, I think he may have been a contractor at the time. So, um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a contractor. So why Google? Why is Google on your radar? And what other companies are potentially on your radar? You know, I can't, you know, honestly, I can't remember who the other, oh, Apple was, because Apple offered me a senior network engineer position over there and they paid more than Google did. Um, uh, they were also going to give me a bigger title, but I went over there and I, uh, you know, this is no thing to Apple and that Apple of that day is probably maybe different than today, but I go over there and it's a total mess and, um, you know, it's not that I couldn't learn stuff from some of the people there. I'm sure I could have, but I don't like coming in and looking at stuff where I'm going, you know, my eyes are so open and uh, uh, people aren't doing some of the basic work they sh that should have been done. I remember there was something like a 100,000 line ACL that they had that the first line was documented as called the speed rule. It was like permit IP any any. So they were just loading their boxes with 100,000 line ACLs that weren't doing anything. And, uh, you know, and they knew this and they were too afraid to change it. And every change required three VP signatures to do anything and uh, didn't want to be in that thing. Um, but they pay them more and they gave a bigger title and stuff like that. And uh, at Google, I met people who were way smarter than I was, that I was going to learn a lot from those guys. They paid less. They weren't offering as much of a thing. I knew Raleigh. He was over there. Uh, he had become like the uh, head of network engineering. And, um, but I had some stuff that they didn't have. I had network engineering skills and I could program and they didn't have, they had some, uh, they had a net tools department. It was just kind of starting. Um, but they wanted some engineers who did that. You met Raleigh at Lucas or how'd you meet Raleigh? Yeah, I met, I met him at Lucas. He was, um, he was the uh, he was the head of networking there. I got merged in with him as the you know, um, like all mergers, you know, when the Highlander thing came, there can be only one, and you know, various you know, there's two networking managers. One mine was gone, and then you know, the new network, you know, he became the head of network for everybody, and you know, up above him, the director of IT, you know, one person went, another person claimed the throne. So Raleigh finally says, "Hey, I got a position over here for you." Uh, he said, well, it, it didn't work quite that well. It, you know, you got to get you know, Google's, Google's. You got to go through the interview. Google got to go through those interviews. Uh, especially, or at least back then you did. Uh, it's a little different now. They can they can move you through if they want. Um, but, uh, you know, back then it was less, a lot less of that. Were I, you nervous? Past, were you nervous going through the interview? How long did that take to interview at Google? It was probably like seven or eight hours of interviews plus a lunch break in that. And that's it. And then they made a decision because today it's like six months, <laughs> right? Like three to six months of, uh, well, you know, yeah, back then, um, it did take, it did take longer because so, you know, having been in the interview process at Google and uh, having uh, still knowing something about it today, uh, usually it doesn't take that long, you know, 90 days, maybe at most, but, uh, you know, the interview process, you know, uh, back then was a lot less solid. So, um, and less of a process you interview with a hundred bunch of people, they scored, it goes to hiring committee, the hiring committees met whenever they did back then. But when I got hired, the founders had to sign off on you. So your stuff went up to a founder review and Sergey and Larry personally looked over your stuff before they checked the box and they would reject, they would reject some. Um, maybe about six months into when I was working there, the founders just couldn't keep up with that, that load and, you know, it changed. Um, 
but yeah, so I was nervous because I had to turn I turned down the Apple job in that, and I don't want to be at Lucas anymore. And I'm hoping that Google's going to say yes. And I think it took two or three months. But you got it. That's brilliant. I did get it. Um, I, I but I don't think it's because I was brilliant. I think it was more because they were understaffed and they would hire any person who could would take that pager from them, just anybody. Like, and my. I was on call like the first month I was there and this is the most complicated network I'd ever seen. And they were just like, they just threw the pager at you basically and said, sink or swim, buddy. <laughs> Dude, I had one job where I, where the database was running on a, a Unix machine and they gave me pager duty. And I had maybe, I mean, I was a PC guy. I would maybe spent a week with one guy banging out some commands to keep the database up and running. And they gave me the pager for this system and it goes off and they're like asking me questions. I'm like, dude, I, I'll hack on this thing. But I, 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 I mean, it was stressful at the time to just be thrown into a support oh, and not know anything. I remember being at my, so I lived in Marin. I'd have to drive down from Marin um, all the way through San Francisco into the South Bay. And so my commute was like three hours a day. When I was on call, I couldn't even leave the house because I, I couldn't, I just couldn't, I couldn't get there in time without getting hit with a thousand pages. And I remember like the first week I was on call, uh, I remember being in a, you know, all of NetOps could fit in a room. We're having our staff meeting and Ben Trainer, the head of SRE and stuff comes in and he's like, yeah, everything, the whole network's dead. And he th throw up a, a thing showing like every data center to data center is dead. And I'm the person on call <laughs> trying to like figure this out. And uh, yeah, you're just like, oh God, oh, you know. This is why I got out of ops. One of my first jobs, it was to manage the IT stuff in this small company, including the Novell Network. Yeah. This was back in 90, 91. Yeah. I was doing some, I was writing code, but I was also responsible. And I remembered every time something broke, it was because a piece of hardware failed. Yep. And this was 91. This was not like um, we go, we'll get it in two hours. This was yep. me learning to be strategic and have closets full of Nick cards, full of these cards, full of those cards, so I could fix it. And when you didn't have the card, everybody's on your ass. Hey, 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 when is it going to be fixed? What's going on? It's going to be fixed. Dude, I, I can't fix this. I don't have what I need. And yep. it's like your fault. Like, and I said, after that, I'm never doing this job again. I'm going to be a software developer because if there's a bug, I can fix yeah. it. Yeah, and if it, but if it's hardware, you're uh, look. I'd be on call at Lucasfilm. They had this. Um, we bought this uh, equipment called Foundry, which got bought by Brocade, which is now Dell, I think. Um, and they had this thing that everybody was going through this Molex issue, and uh, you know, so like every optic on these things died, right? So randomly, and so you know. Three days a week, you're in there after hours replacing hardware. You don't have the hardware, that stuff doesn't come up. Game developers are, you know, uh, if they're in crunch time or whatever, they are not happy people when their stuff doesn't work. <laughs> you know, we had, I mean, we, we even had someone try to kick in a door on us into the IT room because we had locked doors at the, at the place because they had, were having an, they were having an outage and uh, they were so mad. Right, because they they had a demo due, and uh, you know it's due when it's due. <laughs> I just I just hated it. I hated it not having the ability to fix it. And back then, at least, it was all hardware. So sometimes you're just looking for a hardware part, right? Like you know, yeah, and you want to be the guy who didn't stock the part, and then you got to justify stocking the part, you know, to somebody somewhere who's going. Uh, when some of those parts are expensive, when you're like, yeah, it's ten thousand dollars, it's like well, how long can we be down without it? And you're trying to get them to pay. <laughs> you know what we did in this company because I was so adamant about having spare parts. We became some sort of vendor or something. We didn't have to pay taxes. We did something where we could buy wholesale and not have to pay tax. So reseller, you became some type of reseller? We became some sort of reseller on paper <laughs> and we were able to get the parts cheaper. Like that was kind of cool, right? Yeah. You know, but which, okay, we got... 20 minutes left here. I want to cover kind of where you are today for sure. Tell me how long you were at Google. 12 years, 12 and a half. Something. 12 years. Whoa, 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 whoa. Dude, that's like a lifetime and a half for anybody at a tech company. That's a long, long time, dude. Uh, it, it, it felt like it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, look, we got like 15 minutes left, so I, I'm sure we can do an entire podcast on 12 years at Google. Maybe what you can kind of tell me is the, the, what was your journey, the timeline or the journey kind of through Google? What, you started in that small engineering sort of group, but how did that progress for, for 12 years? Like, what happened? So, I, I joined, uh, I joined the, net, uh, the network engineering group at Google. And uh, I started out as a network engineer, so I was doing you know similar stuff to what I was doing when I was over at uh, Lucasfilm, just on a much larger scale. And uh, there was so much to learn; it was just it was crazy. And uh, I started, uh, you know, I started it, it started really on a journey with uh, more network automation. So when I was at Lucasfilm, I was automating myself out of a job while I was there because I didn't like to do were, you know, the same thing over and over again. I like to push the button like the Jetsons guy. So I uh, started automating my way. So when I went to Google, uh, one of my first jobs there was automating things like uh, all their uh, rack switch upgrades for all the uh, the racks at uh, and all the data centers. So I automated that out and then uh, started automating everything there. So I started as a real, you know, uh, doing things that looked a little more like scripts, uh, moving to things that looked more like services, and then I started really moving into um, building large services, orchestration services for network uh, rollouts. Um, most of the network rollout uh, code was generated by me for uh, their B2 backbone, which is their vendor backbone. And then as part of that, they didn't really have a role for a person who was like me. And so they created a role in SRE called the uh, network systems engineer. And so I became the first network systems engineer at Google. And then, uh, so then I was an SRE at the end of that. So, um, and, you know, just uh, kept accelerating that journey. So, uh, so mostly. Let me ask you a question. Let me, let me ask you a question. Because first of all, my networking skills are like pretty pitiful. I can code a socket and send data across it. But beyond that, I'm done. You're using the word network in a very liberal way. And when I think network, I think that you're focused on the Cisco routers and all that connectivity, but it also sounds like you're responsible for the software that's running on the network. Yeah, so we, you know, when I started at Google, we were almost exclusively in our backbone. Uh, we were using Juniper routers, and you know, still they're using Juniper routers today. And uh, we slowly introduced a couple others um, into the network. But, uh, but at that scale, um, you need, you need software to kind of manage that, right? Um, everything from like peering. So, you know, if someone wants to peer with Google and we want to set peering, do you want a network engineer to waste hours doing that? Or you want software to do it for you, right? Where the people come in, they sign into a peering account and, uh, you know, they register, we approve the registration and they can reserve a port, pay us. And then, you know, have BGP set up automatically for them and things like that. Um, but also, like when we want to change metrics, or you want to apply BGPLU to a connection, or um, you need to update update your SRLG maps or your ACLs or all these other things on you know ten thousand nodes, um, and at the network level, more than the service level, any mistake is catastrophic. So um, we had outages due to people where a one line change wiped out things like Asia, just gone, the whole network gone. Um, and with networking, that's really easy to do. So you, what you want to do is have machines in the way to do it for you. So that's what I got really involved in. Do you have networks for the networks? <laughs> no. You like, you got to go update 10,000 nodes. You got to do that over the network. Is that on a separate network? <laughs> no, um, though you do have some backup. So, and then there are networks for networks too. Like when you look at their, like, uh, cause you know, Google is when I was there started making their own network equipment because they needed the networks to get cheaper. So, uh, for example, we went from, uh, buying rack switches from vendors to building our own rack switches, to building our own cluster switches, to, you know, building our own inner data center connected switches. And then those all have to be managed by software we write. Um, the platforms group does. So uh, in some of those, there's actually the control plane network that controls, you know, the stuff that's actually pushing traffic is actually another complete separate network. Um, but you also have like, we would have dial up uh, in case the router completely failed, 
for some of these routers. So if they were critical. And keys to the building when you wipe out your BGP information, right? <laughs> like Facebook did. <laughs> well, the, the problem was like, you know, all the time I did network engineering with some of these things at Google, I only saw a router twice when I was there. Every It's all remote. Like, you know, you know the data centers are, you know, in some cases, you know, multiple states or countries away. So um, I, I don't can't think of an instance where we had to. I'm sure it happened where we had to have someone with keys go in uh, and hook us in. But for most of the time, we had dial up, and then what we'd have them do is fix the dial up connection, right? Or come into a peer router that we could still get to, and then come across the peer. But do you remember when Facebook made that mistake where they were no longer what is it called an AS or something? They were no longer a um, I don't know, right? They they did some of their I don't know enough here. The BGP they they took themselves off the internet. I, I don't know what I, I, they there was uh, there was an outage like this last year. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I want to say this is actually a was a. I'm trying to remember if this was they were they were doing something with their BGP automation, and I just I don't remember what they did. But yeah, I mean, you know, you you knock out your you know your AS represents you know, your entire thing. You do something weird with that. that you know, <laughs> stop announcing it. It's a big problem. <laughs> yeah, I can't even imagine what was going on there that day. Okay, so every time somebody hacks a computer system, my mom calls me up and says, I want to know how to do that. And I start laughing, right? And I'm like, Ma, the, you, first of all, nine times out of ten, it's an inside job. Second of all, you have to have, like, the networking skills of a John Doke. Like, you just can't, right? I mean, uh, I'm just saying that, but like, you have those networking skills. Like, you really can visualize how everything's connected and how everything talks to each other. You can't be a hacker to that level without, I think, these this, this level of networking skills. So, one, thanks for being a good guy. <laughs> like, if John got bored tomorrow... <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know enough about hacking because I haven't participated in that realm. But, um, you know, some of the, you know, I, it, yeah, no, when you're DDoSing someone or something, it helps to know about networking and such. I, I think a lot of times hacking is mostly social engineering someone to do something, install something, or knowing about a vulnerability on a system that, you know, um, than it is regular networking work. But if you can take, but if you can take advantage of a vulnerability in networks, I mean, you, no one exists you know, like they can't even get online right so if that's your if that's your goal if you if your goal is to is to prevent them from working you know networking is 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 great uh if you want to steal their credit card i don't know networking helps you so much well it's always they broke into the fbi they broke into that right they did that over the network like okay yeah well it had to be an inside job mom because nobody's going through a router unless they've got some form of a right credentials I think I think a lot of times they trick someone into installing something and then, you know, the network's just the transport out. Then the connection goes from the inside to the outside to a system and then they they, they come back over that that connection. I think that's what happens most of the time um, versus, you know, a lot of times when I watch an NCIS episode, you know, they're, you know, McGee is, you know, sneaking into the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> and he throws, he throws all these networking terms that don't go together. And I'm like, what? Oh, that hurts my head. What do you think about the work that's going on at TailScale? Have you seen the, the kind of stuff they're doing to create connectivity? Well, so, you know, I've used TailScale a little. Um, I just, you know, I don't I don't have as much need for their service. You know, I just create my own stuff to, to do the little things I need. And uh, but, uh, you know. Look at who's look who's running that place. I mean, Brad's there, and um, you know, a couple other just real geniuses. And uh, I'm sure their stuff is you know rock solid. Uh, they were doing something new that they they announced with SSH recently, you know. And I haven't I haven't gone through the announcement. They're brilliant. I mean, they're brilliant. Their new IP library is brilliant. Um, you know, you know, backwards compatible with the standard library, and you know, it does all these other things that are really nice. So yeah, I think they're, I think they're an incredible team. You spend 12 years at Google. You're working like, like I have to tell people in class all the time, like you don't have Google scale. There's maybe five companies on the planet that have Google scale. So why are you worried about that? Right. You're not Google. Right. Don't pretend you're ever going to be Google. Don't want to be Google. When I talk about scale, right. So, so slow down here on your architecture and your design, but you, have learned over 12 years, over a decade, how to deal with Google scale. So what happens in this kind of year 12? Do you, I dare again, a lifetime, 
do you feel like you've accomplished everything you want to accomplish at Google and you want to try to do it again at another big company? Like Microsoft is the next place for you or is there something in between? So Microsoft is the next place. Uh, to be honest, I was, I, I had gotten bored, you know, I, you know, and I'd been through, you know, one too many, you know, department shakeups. Um, and, uh, but I was fairly bored because, you know, at this point I can't say that, you know, that Google hasn't done anything new and innovative in, uh, that space in, at this point, seven or eight years. In 12 years. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> in 10 years, <laughs> you know, when, like when I, when I, you know, networking is mostly, if you really think about it is okay, you know, you know, bigger, better, faster in the same chassis, right? That's, that's generally. And when I started working with Google, Google was at such a uh, scale that they couldn't even do that. They, they were having to invent their own equipment. We were using experimental stuff from Juniper, like their, I call it experimental because it never truly worked well, like their TX Matrix series, which is like four routers and a chassis router thing that kind of worked um, because we're, our scale is, you know, we're just growing so much. So we're pushing the, the networking industry. But, you know, after that, a lot of what happens at Google is just reinvention of what already works and exists. Um, because people need to get promoted and they have a lot of employees, right? So, um, yeah, that's what happens when you get to be that big. Um, but there was little innovation really going on. Uh, cloud was starting, you know, cloud was starting to pick up. Cloud needs are very different than the core needs that Google has. Google, for its faults and its stuff, their core, their core development infrastructure is amazing, right? Uh, you know, it, people compare like Borg's internal thing to Kubernetes on the outside. Um, they kind of are the same, but uh, in that Kubernetes looks like it's based on Borg and that's about where the similarities end. Uh, Borg is superior in every way, but Borg doesn't let you do anything you want. You do it one way. That's the only way anything's done, but all that is completely integrated together from the development environment all the way up and you don't get choices You're, You know, if you want to use an RPC service, your answer is stubby, which is uh, the internal version of gRPC. Um, you don't get choices and choice actually is kind of paralyzing, right? It's really easy to bring up an engineer in Google. You know, you take some classes, you learn how this works, you learn how this works, you're ready to go. Um, when you leave Google, none of that is, is the case on the outside. When you actually develop on the actual cloud, there's a million ways to do anything and nothing integrates together well. So, um, so I was just bored and uh, no one was doing anything really new. They were just kind of, you know, either reinventing what already had been done or twisting the knobs to make stuff a little faster. Um, I had some, I had a friend who was left Google. They built the data centers there. He was over at Microsoft. I was looking for a change. Uh, they offered me really decent money, uh, which couldn't hurt. And so they said, Hey, we've got a bunch of problems over here. You know, we need to be able to scale Azure better, you know, come over and help us. So, uh, Todd Curtis was there, Les Lincoln was there, um, and I was like, okay, well, I know these people, I'll, you know, go over and do some work over there. And that's where you've been ever since. That's where I've been ever since. Have you been able to solve those problems that they had? Have you, were you able to kind of just walk in and and really take, no? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> You know, there was uh, years ago, there was this, uh, these diagrams of how all these companies work, you know, how Google's hierarchy worked and, you know, uh, Facebook's, you know, Mark Zuckerberg here, everybody falling in line, AWS and some stuff. And Microsoft had this thing with clouds of groups and they were all pointing guns at each other. And there's a certain amount of truth to that, you know, it's a little <laughs> tongue in cheek, but it, I mean, it, it's, it's certainly true uh, in some regards. Um, move, things move slowly there in those kind of ways. Um, you know, you know, micro, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, it's not like Azure is doing bad. Azure just keeps making money. You know, it's just rolling in money. They all, you know, all sorts of breadth of services that, you know, other people don't even get close to AWS and get close to it integrates with all these different things and stuff. So the challenges are harder there. I heard it's the largest cloud. I heard that because of the enterprise, Azure is the largest cloud. It, it, may, it, may, it might be. I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I doubt it is, I mean, it depends on, all these things are depending on how you define it. I would say maybe 
maybe with cu- the amount of customers and stuff that are on it, um, external, yes. You know, and they prob- my guess is, and I don't have any numbers to back anything up. So everybody take a grain of salt with what I say. I imagine Google has the biggest compute infrastructure and in networking in the world because they have to serve search. You know, that's their primary customer, right? Before you get the cloud, cloud's this big and search is this big. Um, where in Microsoft, it's, you know, 0365, it's, you know, with Exchange services and then, you know, all the Azure services too. And those are all, you know, customer-based stuff that's running on it. So same thing as like, you know, um, you know, I don't know how big AWS is having any experience on it. Uh, you know, I imagine their biggest customer is Amazon and then everybody else is their secondary customer. We got five minutes left. I want to talk about, honestly, I do want to talk about the book because... Did you know how much work that was going to be before you thought, hey, let's write? Because most people don't realize how much work it's going to be. Would you write another book? Would you do it again? (laughs) It's, you know, (laughs) it's like if someone gets run over by a car and you ask them if they're going to cross the street right after it happened. I'm I'm not really sure. Uh, You know, I knew it was going to be just a ton of work. Um, you know, but knowing it and the reality of it are end up being two different things because life hasn't hit you and everything else. And so, you know, when I got approached, we're deep in the pandemic. I'm not going anywhere. I've been sitting on a couch for, you know, are you sitting in my house for, you know, months? And so I'm like, well, I ain't got anything else to do. So sure. Uh, and even then I was kind of like, do I want to do it? My wife uh, was like, no, no, you should absolutely do it. You should do it. You know? And uh, I'm like, yeah, it sounds like work and I'm allergic to work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's work, man. Uh, you know, that's why I got into automation is because I wanted to like, you know, not do work. So, um, would I do it again? You know, let's talk in a year or two about that. And it's a massive book. So like, yeah, no, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I said I would never write another book after the one that I wrote and I ended up writing a second one, but it took maybe six years to, uh, get over the to first get book. me there. Yeah, and I still have, I you know, P- PSTD. I, I have it still. Like I can write a blog post. I'm good. You talk to me about a book, and I start to shake, man. It's, <laughs> it's 18 months. I, if if it doesn't take 12 to 18 months, I don't know what the quality of the book is going to be. And the publisher was on us like every day. You know, like they're just that. You know, if I if if I wrote if I wrote another book, I would write the book and. It, say, I've got a book to the publisher. I wouldn't go the other way around again. Yeah, and I self-published the second one primarily too because of that. I just didn't want that pressure on me. When it's done, it's done. And even that still took 12 months. Um, so yeah, I get it. But I'm I'm excited. And you said the book just, I feel like the book's been out. The book just came out the last few Month weeks. And a half this ago, is probably about two months ago, maybe. Ah, nice, nice. I'm most definitely buying this book now, just just for the open telemetry stuff. I, I wanna, I wanna get your thoughts on all of that. That sounds sounds super interesting to me. I just want to learn that tech more in terms of. You're the second person I've heard now. Maybe no, maybe the third or fourth person I've heard now about replace your logs with tracing. And honestly, I think maybe maybe I'm too old, like I've aged out, but I can't wrap my head around that idea just yet. So. I want you to, con- I want to read the book and be convinced. Just think of it as, you know, just think of it this way. Targeted logs, just the logs you want, right? That's it. Instead of parsing through all the stuff you don't want, and you know how you're always looking for that needle in the haystack, you just get the logs you do want and with metrics. So, uh, you know, that's really your difference and across all your systems. So if you've got one big system, you know, it doesn't matter. If you're, if you've got 18 systems is talking through, uh, you want it all to coordinate and it lets you coordinate those logs. So that's really the strength of it. All right. Last question. What sort of tech related stuff are you s- interested in right now? What is, what are you looking at as, as you're saying, I have to learn this. This is the next thing I, I kind of want to learn. You know, it's kind of weird. So everybody, you know, keeps, you know, I always, you know, everybody wants to learn blockchain or AI related stuff, which I think is the least interesting of, you know, anything that's going on right now. You know, I actually keep wanting to move backwards instead of forwards. So like, I'm more interested in, you know, writing my own compilers or, you know, writing my own formats to replace protocol buffers or, you know, writing my own kernels to, you know, um, what, you know, what can I do with a kernel? Uh, you know, I'd love to get more into Rust. 
Um, you know, I don't, I, you know, my problem with Rust is it's not that it doesn't look like a great language. I've read a book on it. It seems great. I can just never find a project that is worthy of that kind of speed um, and pain because it, you know, it's more painful to go through. Um, but, you know, those are the kind of things I'm more interested. I'm more interested in stuff that was developed in the 70s, how they did that. Um, like I've been reading lately, um, uh, one of the original books on uh, where they detailed out the original Unix kernel. Uh, I had to buy it, a, a used book I had to go find. It. I found out that, you know, Thompson and, and them had, uh, you know, um, you know, blessed the, what was in it. And, and then I'm super fascinating at that stuff. You know, everything else that seems to come out today just seems to be a new iteration of what we've already seen. I'm going to throw two texts, two pieces of tech out at you that I have a strong belief that you would be interested in. One is a new programming language called Q-Lang, C-U-E Lang. Have you heard of Q-Lang? I have not. Oh, dude. Oh, dude. This is, I may have just ruined your weekend. C-U-E Lang. I'm not going to say anything. I, I, you, go look that up. That's right in your wheelhouse, dude. That, that's it right there. Now, the other one, I, I have no doubt you've heard of already. So I expected you to say EBPF since you're, you're getting so into the kernel. So EBPF, uh, I first heard about uh, Facebook invited me to a private thing is years ago. Um, you know, a private tech viewing of what they were doing internally. And you had to sign out these NDAs and, you know, all this other stuff. And I think this is so long ago, I was still working at Google. Um, Phoenix was working over there and some other people I knew. And I, so I went over to this thing. I was in, invited by, I think one of the, the guys who was head of networking at the time, Peter. And, uh, um, I, I saw that. It's a really interesting technology. I know some people who are writing you know, stuff for that at Google. Um, but, uh, you know, because they're using a lot of networking stuff nowadays to really speed stuff up. It's interesting, I, you know, um, but I kind of left that wheelhouse a while ago and I just haven't been interested in going back. I thought you'd be interested in it only because you can now do some level of kernel programming, right? And, and, and kind of get deep. Yeah, you're writing this little state machine, right? That that go that you kind of insert into the kernel and stuff. Um, I, I do find it. Fa I do find fa I, it's a fascinating technology. I just have you know at this point I don't have any use for it. Back, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, five six years ago, I might have had a real use for it. Um, but nowadays, I just don't have anything I'm I'm doing with it. But it is interesting tech. I've read I, I've read about it at different points. My knowledge has kind of fallen out in the last couple of years on it. The stuff I'm uh, the other thing I'm kind of interested in is um, WASI. The WASM extension where you're, you WASM. Now make, well, there's WASM, then there's WASI. Oh, I got to look up WASI. Yeah. So this is where you start to have, uh, you know, programs that are making system calls and such. So now you're running, you're compiling your Go or anything else into WASI and you're running it anywhere. So. Okay. I haven't heard of this stuff. I haven't heard of the WASI. I even looked it up real quick. I couldn't even find anything. This has got to be real cutting edge now. I, I will send it to you. So there's a lot of, there's a lot on, uh, you know, you can, you now you can start making things that are WASI compatible. They can call, e they can self call each other. Um, so you have your Go program calling C++, calling Rust programs, all compiled down to WASI and, um, you know, and you can deploy these anywhere. So, and they're like, I think they think they're 15% or something, you know, slower than if you did native code, but now you have something that runs anywhere. So it's kind of like that old, you know, remember when the Java was run, you know, run anywhere and then it didn't really run anywhere, but this looks like they're trying to really make that happen now. So that's interesting. That's another thing that's interesting to me is all the, uh, you know, the WASM stuff, WASM, WASI. All right. Send me that. We'll also add it to the to show notes, but promise me uh, you'll look at the Q-Lang. I will look at Q-Lang as soon as we get off here. C-U-E-Lang. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to ping you in like a week to, to get your opinion on that. I, th I think it's just right in your wheelhouse. So I'm super interested in your thoughts there but we are oh, so unfortunately out of time here so yes. i want to thank you for uh hanging out with us as long as you did uh talking to us about your career and your, your book and all that cool stuff john if anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to this what's the best way for them to talk to you uh well you can reach out to me uh my email is uh well i'm not gonna give out my private you can reach me if at Microsoft at uh, jdoak at microsoft.com. Um, you can ping me on any of my GitHub stuff. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Yeah, and we'll add that all to the show notes. So, John, thank you again for hanging out with us. This is Bill Kennedy and John with the On Labs podcast signing off. Hope to see everybody again real soon.